Colonel! Colonel March! Oh, there you are, March. I thought I'd lost you. Start to ride. Come, come, March. No need to be polite with me. You think I'm a bore. Well, I am. <laughs> that uh, paper of yours, uh, Stamps Interpret History, an excellent effort for an amateur. Mm. First rate. You'll turn my head, Doc. <laughs> but you haven't heard the last word yet. How could I? Supposing I was to tell you that I had in my possession a stamp that no collector ever dreamed existed. A mint issued in Etruria. Approximate date, 764 B.C., 300 years before the Romans conquered the Etruscans. The first postage stamp. What would you say if I were to tell you that? I'd say, don't tell me. Impossible, eh? Well, come down with me to Burlington and I'll show it you. I'm afraid my other work would Ah, you. your work. <laughs> that department of queer complaints. Pooh, a subterfuge. You don't believe me. You don't want me to gloat over me. I confess, if you had an Etruscan stamp, I'd be compelled first to destroy my own collection, then myself. Too bad. You're lost, Mart. Well, must be going now. Oh, by the way, remember John Barton? Oh, very well indeed. A great man. Did you ever meet his secretary? Fellow named Hartley, Harold Hartley. Oh, decent chap, Hartley. Patient of mine. An attempt has been made to kill him. I treated him. All incompetent, of course. What did the local police say? Nothing. The fellow hasn't uh, mentioned it to anyone yet, except myself. And that was by accident. Maybe he wants to be killed. Oh, hardly. Can't possibly tell the police. You see, the villain seems to be John Barton's son. Just 12 years old. Is that queer enough for you? Well, got a train to catch. Think it over, March. Come and see my stamp. And perhaps you'll prevent Hartley from being killed. But shoot yourself. <laughs> There's a call for Dr. Ivy. Might you know where he is, sir? He's just gone. You've missed him. Sir? Man's a crackpot. What's it, sir? I say... I'm afraid you... Dr. Ivy? Dr. Ivy? Mr. Hartley's had an accident. He fell. I had to call you. There's no one else who can help. Please come. Please. <laughs> Good evening. Is Dr. Ivy here? What's your business with Dr. Ivy? Well, my name is March. Is it? It is indeed. Oh, Wrigley, don't be so grumpy. Dr. Ivy is expecting someone to see Mr. Hartley. You didn't say you were a doctor? Nor am I. Oh, Wrigley, let him come in. Thank you. If you were in bed as you should be, you wouldn't be here telling me my proper conduct. I'll go to bed in a minute, as soon as I've shown him Mr. Hartley's room. This way, sir. Then what's your name? Andrew. You look very like your father. Do you know him? Oh, not as well as I'd have liked to. I only met him two or three times. But I know all about his work, of course. You don't know. You only know about his books and what he did in the war. Nobody knows about my father. Nobody but me. Nobody knows the things I know. Really? Dr. Ivy is waiting. Mr. Hartley had a bad fall. It was from here. They're in there. Good night. Good night. If you liked, I could show you the place where my father worked. Well, thank you. I'd like that very much. I don't show it to everybody. Ah. Oh, there you are. Thought you'd never get here. Mrs. Barton, my friend March. Oh, how do you do? How do you do? I told him I wanted another opinion, March. Yes, it was good of you to come. Not at all. Hartley? Colonel March. How do you do? Huh? Fine chap, March. 
Knows his stuff about stamps, too, eh? Oh, well, thank <laughs> you for coming, but it really wasn't necessary. He could have been killed. Mrs. Barton gets alarmed very easily. I think I'll live, my dear. Now, you got off lucky. Just a cracked head, slight concussion. He'll be up and about tomorrow. Yes, he'll be up and around tomorrow. And what'll happen then? Will he be so lucky the next time? Oh, why won't you let me call the police? Now, I've told you we're not going to talk about it anymore. Oh, She'll be all right. They're going to get married, uh, Hartley and Mrs. Barton. Oh, congratulations. Oh. Yes, you see, much that's what it is. The boy's jealous. Father complex. Oh, what are you talking about, Ivy? Oh, I presume you've told Mr. Hartley that I'm from Scotland Yard. Mm. But I made no complaint of any kind. All this fuss about a few childish pranks. Nothing but normal boyish mischief. <laughs> no, Hartley. And that slate on the roof which smashed your shoulder was hardly mischief, was it? He doesn't want to trouble the boy's mother. I couldn't go to the police, Colonel. I worked for John Barton and I was his friend, and I'm proud to think that his widow wants to marry me. And I'd rather die than cause her any pain. Well, your death at the hands of her son is hardly calculated to make her joyful. When was the first attempt? About six weeks ago. And I assume that this was after you had announced your intention of marrying Mrs. Barton. Two days later. A block of slate dropped on him. Had it hit him square, might have split his head like an egg. I'd just come out of the house, something, I don't know what it was, made me move, and it just caught me a glancing blow on the shoulder. Just took his arm out of the sling day before yesterday. And today's fall down the stairs? Well, I saw the wire too late, I was hurrying. You're sure you're not omitting anything? Well, of course you are, the boy. Your relationship with the boy, Hartley. I was with John Barton the night his son was born. And when John was away, as he often had to be away, I was his substitute for Andrew's father. As far as it's possible for a man to be a friend of a boy's, I was his friend. There's nothing criminal there. He's a child. He thinks like a child. He behaves like a child. With a childish desire to kill you. What makes you so certain of that? Because he told me so. He made a confession of this? Well, a confession implies guilt. There was no guilt there. It was simply a statement. Objectively, without emotion. Only disappointment that he hadn't succeeded. No, yeah, little fellow's potty. Should be locked away. Can you think of any reason as to why he wants to kill you? No, I don't know what to think. Well, do you agree with Ivy that he resents your marrying Mrs. Barton? Well, when we first told Andrew, he seemed overjoyed. Then suddenly, two days later, it was all changed. To the point of wanting to kill you? But why? Well, I can only give you the reason that he told me. He actually told you why he wanted to kill you? Yes. Yes, he said... He said his father told him to. I see. What do you see? Barton's been dead these three years. Unless he's sending messages from the other world. Might very well be. Mrs. Barton thought you might be comfortable in this room. I'm so sorry to inconvenience you. I had no idea the last train to London left so early. Well, there's a train first thing in the morning. Thank you. I'll get you some towels. Hello. I've brought you some pajamas. They're Mr. Hartley's. That's very kind of you, Andrew. Is he going to die? Of course not. What an idea. Just a nasty bump on the head. It was very careless of him falling down those stairs, wasn't it? Yes. Has Dr. Ivy gone? I think so. Why? Are you going to sleep now? Listen, if you don't run along, I'll be in bed before you are. Good night. Good night, Andrew. Is there anything else you want? No, thank you. Oh, Mrs. Wrigley, uh, Andrew mentioned that his father had a laboratory. Would that be in the house? The laboratory's all locked up. It hasn't been touched for years. I noticed a building in the garden. Would that be it? Nobody ever goes there. Good night, Mrs. Wrigley. I 
What do they call to London? Inspector Ames speaking. Who's there? Oh, Colonel March. Well, of course I mind being woken up. Anybody in his right mind would mind. What do you know about John Barton? You mean John Barton, the scientist? He's dead. Well, as I recall it, Ames, some of the circumstances surrounding his death were never quite cleared up. Now, I want proof that he actually is dead. That means you've got to get out of your nice, warm bed. I know, but I need the evidence tonight. Now, take this number down, Burlington 78. Call me at any time. I won't be asleep. of you, my boy. You were too young to avenge my murder. No, I promise. Trust me, Father. Very well. Then once more, for the last time, go to my cabinet. You will find there a small green bottle. A few drops in his drink of tea tomorrow will be enough. Can you do that? Good night, my son. Sleep well. I sincerely hope I've interrupted your beauty sleep, Colonel. I don't want to be the only person in the world awake at this hour. Your humor aim is at three o'clock in the morning. It's even less attractive than usual. What did you find out? Well, nothing that will satisfy you. Now, what do you mean by that? I told you that Barton was dead. 
and he really is dead. It so happened that he was on government business flying an experimental plane, um, electronic stuff, and the plane crashed in the Orkneys. There was a thorough investigation and all the bodies were recovered. In the case of Barton, there was absolute medical and dental identification. The official verdict was accidental death. Can I go back to bed now? No. Don't tell me you still don't believe it. Uh, do one more thing for me, Ames. I want you to come down here tomorrow. Now listen carefully. Well done. Jolly good, darling. You're too good for me, Andrew. Tea's late, isn't it? I'll go and hurry up, Cook. No, I'll go. No, I want to go. Tea feels so splendid. And you'll have milk, won't you, Harold? Thank you, Andrew. Andrew's having a fine time. You're fond of children, aren't you? I am not. But oh, I know we're supposed to adore them simply because they're small, young, and don't know very much. We're acting justice. Nobody's supposed to be fond of adults simply because they're adults. But you seem to be getting on so well with Andrew. That's because he doesn't take advantage of being 12 years old. Uh, look, you are saying something nice about my son, aren't you? Of course he is, my dear. Yes, he's been more like himself today. More like he was before John died. Before we decided to get married. Well, he was terribly devoted to his father. It's only natural he should have a little difficulty in getting used to it. To me, you mean? Now, look, if he'd objected to you, he'd have said so. Would he? Did you discuss it with him privately? Yes. What did he say? It's not what he says that matters. It's how he feels. What did he say? Well, it was as if he was repeating something. As if he'd been told to say what he did, as if he, somebody else was speaking through him. You say when your son spoke to you, it's as though someone else was speaking? Yes. Who was it? Who? Who? It was as though I heard the voice of... Hello, Hartley. Mind if I come in? No, oh, come and join us in a cup of tea. No, thanks. Perhaps later. Got to talk to March about a private matter. Do you mind, Phyllis? No. I do. Tea first. And got it here, March. Since you wouldn't come to the mountain, I brought the mountain to you. But if you can wait, so can I. Remember, he who gloats last. <laughs> well, how's everything? Oh, never better. Dine, fine, just keep out of trouble. <laughs> uh, milk and sugar, Colonel Martin. Neither, thank you, Mrs. Barton. Oh, I'll take that, Andrew. No. Thank you. Oh, oh, thanks. <clears throat> no, let me make more room for you. No, no, no. I look after this. in such a hurry. Oh, there you are, Ames. Just in time. May I introduce my friend, Inspector Ames? This is... Inspector? Did you say Inspector? Are you a policeman? Here, let go of the boy. I knew there was something peculiar about him. You're a very discerning woman, Mrs. Wrigley. Well, Ames? Oh, yes, Colonel. It's faint, but it's there. It's aconite. Aconite? That's a poison. Aconite, a poison. Mrs. Barton, in the last few moments, two attempts at murder have been made at your table. But who? Why? What did I tell you, March? It's the boy. The boy? What? Andrew? It's impossible. Somebody killed my father. No, Andrew, that's not true. It is. I know it is. I know because he told me. He told me himself. Andrew? Boy's right, Ames. I heard him myself. Andrew, I want you to ask your father to speak. He won't speak. He only speaks to me. But if he spoke tonight... He won't. I know he won't. All right, Ames. Go 
John Barton. Can you hear me? Andrew. Andrew. Father. Andrew, listen to me. My death was an accident. Mommy, mommy. It was John Barton's voice, but he's dead. Don't listen to him. John Barton was like my own child. That was not his voice. That was someone trying to sound like him. You're faking it all. You're quite right, Mrs. Rickley. It was not John Barton. It was somebody else. Now, Andrew, I want you to listen to me very carefully. I was in this room last night when you were told to put the poison in Harold's milk. And I'm going to show you who told you to do it and how it was done. It was someone who knew that you used to come here every night when you were supposed to be sound asleep in bed. And someone who knew how much you loved your father. Now, just you watch this. Uh, do you know what a two-way wireless set is? Yes, sir. Well, this was hidden in the head of that bus with a loudspeaker and a microphone, so that whoever was talking to you over the loudspeaker could hear what you said in reply. And a set just like this was hidden somewhere in the house, so that whoever was using it could talk to you from there. Well, then Inspector Ames came down from London, and it didn't take him very long to find out where the other set was hidden. Now, look. Inspector Ames. Inspector Ames. Would you be kind enough to tell Andrew in whose room you found that set hidden? In the bedroom of Harold Hartley. He gave Andrew instructions for his own murder. Instructions for his own murder? But it doesn't make sense. Ah, but it will. Andrew here only thought he was carrying out his dead father's wishes. But once Hartley had established the fact that the boy was attempting to kill him, then what more natural that, that one of those attempts should backfire and the boy himself be killed. And when Hartley changed the milk this afternoon, that's what was supposed to have happened. <laughs> but why kill the boy? John Barton left his money to the boy, and then if he died, his mother would inherit it. That's why he wanted to kill the boy, fortune hunter. You come with me, Mr. Hartley? <laughs> Now then, Ivy, what's this urgent business you had with me? Yes. Oh, oh, yes. <laughs> Is this what you're looking for? Well, that's my stamp. You stole it. Oh, no, yours is still in the box. I'm afraid they're both forgeries done by a man who used to live in Capri until they made other arrangements for it. I'm afraid you've been hoaxed, Ivy. Hoaxed? It does look like it, doesn't it? Look here, Marge. Word of honor, I'll never mention. 